Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. People do not decide to become extraordinary. They decide to accomplish extraordinary things. Is a quote from Sir Edmund Hillary, an explorer from New Zealand, who along with the Tibetan mountaineer Tenzing Norgay, were the first to reach the summit of Mount Everest. I thought this was an appropriate quote for our guest today, a New Zealander who set out on a journey and reached remarkable heights, having played a significant role in shaping many aspects of the Australian landscape we know today. Our guest is former public servant, well-regarded businessman and engineer, Tim Besley AC. Previously, Tim has been chairman of the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, Leighton Holdings, and the CIG Group. He was Chancellor of Macquarie University and Managing Director of Monia Limited. His career in the public service included senior roles in the Department of External Territories, the Foreign Investment Review Board, the Department of Treasury, the Commonwealth Department of Business and Consumer Affairs, and the Australian Customs. Tim was awarded Companion of the Order of Australia for his services to the community through the promotion of economic and social development, the advancement of science, innovation and education, and for distinction at the forefront of government and corporate responsibilities. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you could apply to your own life. For our first-time listeners from all over the world, please don't forget to subscribe on your preferred podcast platform. And for our listeners in Switzerland, South Africa, and the United Kingdom, a big hello. I am your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blender Partners, Executive Search, and Board Advisory Firm. In today's episode, we are treated to some fascinating stories from Tim's distinguished career that span both public and private sectors which saw him walk the corridors of power, working closely with Prime Ministers and sharing of the Commonwealth Bank during its privatisation in the 1990s, arguably a groundbreaking moment in Australian corporate history. He reflects on the events that led to this and shares his views on the financial services industry of today, the evolution of public policy and Australia's place on the world stage. We also hear of Tim's beginning as an engineer, landing in Sydney at the then Rose Bay International Airport and going on to work at the Snowy Mountain Hydro Electric Authority, or the Snowy Scheme, which has been hailed as one of the civil engineering wonders of the modern world. So sit back and enjoy taking calculator risks. Tim, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Greg. I'm honoured too that you've asked me to, to come and, and join you. Tim, today, young people are looking out to purchase cars powered by hydrogen or electricity. But when you started out life, in New Zealand, you were riding the horse, six kilometres to school. I was. My parents owned a property uh, at a little place called Tipopo, which is sort of in about the middle of the province of Taranaki. And the school was seven k's away, actually, not six. <laughs> there were no, no buses. Uh, I was pretty small and I rode the horse often bareback. So the beginnings of life were on the farm, were they? They were, but uh, not for a long time because my father changed direction at one point and we put a manager on the farm yep. uh, and moved into to, uh, Hawara, where I resumed my schooling there. We all had our own horses, which was great fun. I was always very busy at the, at the peak times, like weaning the lambs and, and making the hay. My first job 
in haymaking was to lead the stacker horse. I was later graduated to drive the hay rake, yeah, okay. which was horse drawn. Uh, we didn't have a, a tractor till much later. Is that right? <laughs> and then the tumbler sweep, which was also horse drawn, where you scooped the hay onto the prongs of the sweep and then tipped it so that the prongs went in and the handles were curved and it flipped and the hay came out. So it made you <laughs> work hard and kept you pretty fit. It was great fun, actually. Yeah. You've got to be creative, don't you, as a farmer? You do. No one guarantees the crop's going to come through or the you know, the heads are going to get sold at the right price. No, you, you're right. In fact, I remember Dad telling me that he had uh, he'd not sold much of the wool during the Depression and yeah. kept it until the price of wool went up. Is that right? It was threepence a pound, I think he said at the time. But subsequently, of course, with the Second World War, the price of wool shot through the roof. So it was a smart move on his part to, to, to hold on. I don't know what the economics were overall, but I think it was a wise move. And I read somewhere about a poem you quite like. If you think you're a beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win, but you think you can't, it is almost certain you won't. Yes. Pretty, pretty important to you? Yes, it is. And, and Dad was very sort of strong on that kind of thing. He, he made us all learn it. There were four boys in the family. Okay. Uh, he said, the message there is important, boys, you know, just just have confidence. You think if you, if you can think and do something, you've got a much better chance of achieving than if you don't. Now, I read somewhere that you had a, it sounds like a bit of a tough time. I'm not sure the logic behind all this, but you had a doll, a rag doll called, um, what do you call it? Be booty, beauty Be eyes. Beauty eyes, yeah. yes. But it finished up in a pretty, pretty sticky situation. <laughs> well, it... I was very little when I had that. I was little once, Greg. <laughs> in fact, I'll tell you how little I was. When I was at high school in the cadets, our, yeah. our cadet corps, yeah. if they'd lined the battalion up for the tallest at the front and the smallest at the end, yeah. other end, I'd have been right there. <laughs> well, is that right? <laughs> but, but, but anyway, I dragged this little doll around with me um, and it got pretty tacky. And Dad said, uh, I think I was about four at the time, he said, look, it's, it's no good, we're going to have to get rid of this, this, this thing. Uh, I was a bit sad about that, of course. Well, how are you going to do it? He said, well, we're going to burn it in the fire on the, on the stove, you know, the wood fire on the range. And so he said, why don't you go outside and watch the smoke go up the chimney? And you can see perhaps something of beauty. So I went outside and I did see smoke coming up the <laughs> chimney. <laughs> And I felt a bit sort of sad about that. And then I thought to myself, well, this is, this is silly. Don't, don't get weepy or anything. I mean, you've got to be strong. And that's what dad would want. And it was then that I realized I could actually exercise some control over my emotions. And that was a skill that later in my life I found very useful indeed. I think in my life I've had a lot of lucky breaks. That was one of them, yeah, okay. a very early one. All right. Well, speaking of a pretty, pretty big lucky break for us as a country as well. So you graduate, you become an engineer from university. Yes, I did. Okay. And you commence work, but you're looking for the next big break and you see something or hear about there's jobs going over at the Snowy Hydro in Australia. But what's the story behind how you came over? I, I heard stories about this huge scheme um, and I heard amongst other things, that they were paying £600 a year. At that stage, I was earning £325 a year. So I thought, I'll, I'll phone up and see if I can go and talk to the guy who's out here recruiting. Okay. So I did that, and he said, sure, come round. And uh, well, it was one of his staff said, sure, come round. And I met a man who I knew later as one of the two associate commissioners, a, a guy called Tony Merrigan. And we talked for about an hour and he said, um, well, would you like to go away and write out an application? Or would you like me to make you an off an hour? And I said, well, how about an off an hour? And he said, how about 6.30? And I said, I'll take it. <laughs> Simple as that. Well, it was because I never ever applied for a job on the Snowy Mountains Hydroelectric Authority. In fact, that was a bit of an issue of some, some slight concern when I arrived at the temporary headquarters in Sydney 
they couldn't find my application. <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, I never made one. Is that right? <laughs> now, look, for the audience out there, you didn't land in a jumbo jet, did you? No. How, how, how did you come here? Well, we flew across in a, uh, a TEAL, that's a Tasman Empire Airways Limited flying boat. Took six and a half hours, as I remember, and we landed at Rose Bay, which was Australia's first international airport. On the water? On the water. Now, what year was that, Tim? 1950. Okay, so you're coming over as, what, as a 23-year-old? Yes, I was. Okay, so you're coming in as 1950s as a 23-year-old, and you were going to work in the Snowy Hydro Scheme. Yes, that's it. Can you talk us through what was it like to build a career during that time? I think it was all to do with, when I think back about it, it was all to do with Hudson's leadership. And he had a, a philosophy that the things that, that mattered were, was, in one sentence, uh, one few words actually, usefulness to the scheme. If you could be useful to the scheme, you progressed. Uh, if you were prepared to take responsibility, you had the opportunity to do so. It was, it was a young man's job in many ways. There were lots of young engineers from New Zealand and other places. Mm. Uh, and it was just a great training ground for young people and an exciting place to work. You were part of what has turned out to be a great national building scheme. Absolutely. Um, and it showed a number of things. It showed that Australia could do big things. It showed that we were a tolerant society because there were a lot of migrants from all over the world, Germans and Italians and Greeks and people from the Netherlands and just, just about every country in Europe that was on the western side of Europe anyway. Yep. So it, it was... It was a remarkable experience. At that time, Menzies was, was in opposition. Yep. The scheme was actually started by the, the Chifley government, mm -hmm. and it was started under the Commonwealth's defence powers. Right. Menzies in opposition said he was going to shut it down when he came to power. That's right, yeah. Because he was concerned, as, as I now understand it, about its constitutional viability. Anyway, Hudson pressed on and started immediately on a, an immense public relations program. He said, he always called me Mr. Bersley. He said, Mr. Bersley, the taxpayer's got to be able to see what it's getting for its taxpayer's dollars. And so we had these, these bus tours, car convoys, and so on. And, and by the time Menzies came to power, people were talking about this thing, it's our scheme, the Snowy's our scheme, we were, they were proud of it. And he was sort of caught up in that. Of course, then he, we, we started asking him to come and open power stations and dams, and he became a, an amazing supporter of the scheme. And it really wasn't until, I think, 1958, when the Snowy Mountains Agreement was passed, yes. which was between the federal government and the states of Victoria and New South Wales, yep. that we had a sound constitutional base. Is that right? And by that time, we had invested something like 800 million pounds in the, in the scheme. So it was a, it was a very interesting time for, for those reasons, as well as for the experience in engineering and working with people from Europe. And it was just such a wide educational thing really wonderful to have got been part of it and as an engineering feat where, where do you put it for australia i think i'd i would say it's one of the. in fact it was billed once as one of the seven engineering wonders of the world is that right and i think that justified that description really well and when you go to work in part of that what's the atmosphere like tim because these days we seem to be fairly negative about taking risk this is something else isn't it it is it is i think that's part of the culture that I now have, I'm, I'm not a, averse to risk taking. I mean, it's, I think the country as a whole has become too risk averse. You think so, do you? I do. And that's a shame. So, Mr. Hudson. Sir William. Sir William. <laughs> okay. Why were you so impressed by him? Well, he was a great people person and he, he had a, an amazing range of um, focus. He could look at things very broadly and focus on that. 
but he could deal with the most intricate details. A good example of us, when, when the Duchess of Gloucester was coming uh, to visit us, and she was one in the Duke that I conducted around the scheme. Okay. Sir William wanted to know what was the height of the mirror in the ladies' toilet on the Happy Jacks lookout. And people said, what the hell's the commissioner doing asking this? <laughs> Seriously. And somebody asked him, and he said, well, she's a short woman. Yeah, right. She's yeah. got to be sure that she can see the mirror. Yeah. Now, that's, I think, a, a small but example of the man's ability to focus on the minutest of details when that was necessary. So he was an amazing man. I'm going to ask you a question. It's a bigger, bigger point. So you've come over here as a Kiwi. You're not necessarily connected. You've come in saying, I'm going to take it on. I'm an engineer. This is the best project. But you're moving up the ladder. How do you move up the ladder so swiftly? A lot of it's luck, Greg, and taking advantage of that. I mean, when the snowy scheme was coming to an end, um, and it it was a sort of a 25-year scheme anyway, yeah. and it was done on time and on budget, which is easy to say now because times were easier then in, in some respects. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought, well, I need to look where I'm going from here. And I had met and come to respect some senior public servants. And I thought, well, it wouldn't be a bad idea to get involved in the public service. And I ended up joining the Department of Territories, which I thought sounded pretty interesting. I mean, that had Cocos Keeling Island, Christmas Island. Nauru? No, Nauru. Well, it had Nauru in the sense that Australia managed Nauru for, for the, on behalf of the three partner governments in the phosphate business. Okay. That's the Britain, New Zealand and Australia. Yeah. But the, the big issue then was um, bringing Papua New Guinea to independence. Okay. There was a lot of pressure from the third committee of the United Nations to get on with it. And when Whitlam came in in 72, he began to push that very hard too. So territories then had to deal with John Clooney's Ross, who was the Clooney's Ross member who had the lease of the Cocos and Keating Islands, yes. uh, which had been uh, a base, at least a, a refueling point for early flight from Australia to South Africa. Yeah, okay. uh, and you had um, where the Pitcairners ended up, Norfolk Island, yeah. yes. Okay. It had its interest because they, you had this this constant issue about how much government responsibility can they have themselves. Yep. It also was an interesting island because uh, it, it had a, a tax status if you registered your companies there. And there was a an accountant, Neil Halley McIntyre, as I remember, who had the, the, the registration of a whole raft of Australian companies yeah, right. for tax purposes. Uh, but the big job, as I said before, was um, how do we make sure that when they're ready, Papua New Guinea can cope with that. Uh, there, there were there'd been a lot of good work done by the administration, a lot of good education work. Yep. But the institutions that you need to become independent were not very strongly in place. I can recall uh, having to write a report for their public service and how, how to structure it. And it seemed to me to be silly to say to them, we'll just follow our model yeah, right. because you've got different circumstances. So over a period of months, I met with a group of senior local officers, as we call them, mm -hmm. and picked their brains about what they thought. And the report I wrote reflected very largely the kind of views they had about how the service should run. You moved into Treasury as well. And you were, what were you, first assistant secretary? In Treasury, that's... Yes, I was. I, I was yeah, While I was working in territories, mm -hmm. uh, one of the public servants that I had known before was a guy called Jack Garrett. He was a deputy secretary, and he and I had gone to the World Bank to negotiate a loan okay. for, of $100 million, which was based on the economics of the Snowy Scheme, but it was, of course, went into consolidated revenue. Uh, and that was an interesting experience. He was just that where Hudson said to me one day, what are you doing uh, next Saturday, Mr. Besley, or something like that? And I said, well, I don't have any particular plans. And he said, well, I want you to go to, um, to uh, 
Washington with uh, Jack Garrett from Treasury. And I said, oh, 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 anyway. So he just sent me to do that. And anyway, getting back to the how I got to Treasury, Jack phoned me up and said, we're about to advertise a job for uh, the head of the, our foreign investment division. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think you should apply. And I said, well, Jack, hold on. What, what can an engineer do in Treasury? He said, look, you just apply. So I did apply and I was gazetted. And then I found myself in a situation I, I never even knew anything about. There was somebody appealed against my appointment, somebody in the department who felt they had a better claim. And this was all foreign stuff to me. I never knew about these things. <laughs> anyway, I went through the process. I was interviewed and I presume he was and uh, he didn't get it and I did. So I ended up running the Foreign Investment Division, which was very interesting, actually. So this is the FIRB in those days? Or well, what? the FIRB came later. Um, when Whitlam got out, yeah, moved on. Yep. It was, um, and Fraser came in, th that government wanted to change the way we dealt with foreign investment. And I can remember talking to Doug Anthony and um, the, the other country party members, and I found out in, in those days that working with Fraser, he often used the country party for, for things like that. And these guys said, that's what they, we want to do, make it to change the whole basis. And I said, well, with respect, gentlemen, I think we're a country that imports capital and we can't have a situation, I don't think, where it's likely that the rules change every three years and we have an, uh, an election. And they said, well, we'll have to give it a better, different look then. So that's when the idea of FIRB got booted. Okay. And I was detailed off to find a chairman okay. and a deputy chairman, and I would be the executive member. So I found Sir Ian Pettengill and Bede Callaghan, who had just retired as the head of uh, ComBank, as the chief executive. And when I told Treasurer Lynch I'd found these two guys, he said, oh, Pettengill, yes. He said, but but uh, Bede is not a knight. And I said, but Treasurer, you can fix that, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yes, I can, and he did. <laughs> <All right>. So <laughs> so shortly after all that kerfuffle, Bede and I did a world trip to, to explain the government's policy uh, to foreign potential foreign investors, and we went through the UK, US, the UK, and Germany, Etc. Japan, and Bede had a story for every place we landed in. He was a great raconteur, and he was a, a wonderful travelling companion. What do you think, looking at in the, the period of time when you're in uh, as a public servant, focusing on policy, public policy, and serving the ministers of that era, compared to what you're seeing today? Well, it would be wrong of me to to try and be, make too detailed a comparison because it's been a long time since I was there yeah. and a long time since I've known anybody who was uh, the head of a department. Um, I know of them, but I, I've known them. Um, I think the difference is, though, that I see from the outside is uh, in my time, the, the staffer in the minister's office was a departmental officer. Uh, now, they are people that ministers with the approval of the prime minister, I assume, appoints, and they're young, smart people. Mm -hmm. Many, if not all, uh, aspire to a political career, and they're in the office. So it's probably more difficult, I would think, for a departmental head to maintain the sort of role as top policy advisor to the minister with that team of very smart people in the minister's office and talking to him all the time. Right. They managed to make it work, but I think it's a, it's a fundamental difference and I think it makes, just makes life more difficult for the Westminster system to work. Yeah, so do you think we're getting the proper policy or is, well, it, or is think, it being I skewed think, to particular parties or what do you say? I, I think the, you, you would have noticed, as I have, that when the government's changed now, sometimes many of the heads of departments change. Yes. That never used to happen in my day. Okay. Um, I 
was a public servant working for both sides of politics. I don't think either side would have had a clue how they voted. Yeah, and that's right. as it should be. Yeah. The slight politicisation of the public service troubles me. Yeah, right. So, speaking of stuff being in news and in policy, etc., we talked a little bit about Snowy Hydro, but what about Snowy Hydro 2.0? It's getting a bit of a, it's getting a bit of criticism out there at the moment. Well, I think there will always be people who criticise big ideas and, and big constructions and so on. Where it's being built is ideally suited for pump storage. Okay. There's the dam on the upper Murrumbidgee River, Tantangra Dam, and then there's the, the dam by Tumor 3 Power Station. Yep. So you've got head and you've got water. Yep. Now, pump storage is not a strange thing in that part of the Snowy Scheme because of the six units in the Tumor 3 Power Station, three have underhung pumps. Right. And they've been pumping up and back and pump storaging since it was commissioned in 1973. So Snowy 2 is just the same sort of thing. The difference is, the very big difference is, mm -hmm. they've now got a tunnel boring machines at work. Uh, in the days when I was engineer for tunnels, which I was for a while on the Snowy scheme, yeah. you didn't have that sort of equipment. How many years did you have in the public sector? Uh, 14. Did you enjoy it all? I did. I did. It was different. Yeah. Uh, I did. Um, I mean, I happened to be there at the exciting times like the Whitlam dismissal, um, which uh, you had strange, well, I was not fair, I'm going to say strange people. You had interest, an interesting person like Jim Cairns when he became treasurer. He was yeah. um, infatuated with Julie Morosi. Um, yeah. He did some things, signed some documents that he should never have signed. Uh, and you had the Kem Lani affair, the loans affair, with, uh, where largely because Connor wanted to, um, Rex Connor, the strangler as he was known, wanted to uh, build a, a network of uh, pipelines with uh, gas and stuff in. And uh, that vision in lots of ways uh, made sense. I yeah. mean, uh, he he would probably be interested if he were alive today to see how much gas is moved around the country. But the idea of borrowing money from a rather carpetbagger uh, type of man from Europe was a bit nonsensical. Yep. Uh, and that did not do the Whitlam government's image a great deal of good and was one of the reasons why in the end this, this constitutional crisis arose and you can speculate about who did what and who didn't do what and so on. And was the Speaker kept locked out of Parliament House? And there's a very good ABC podcast on that. There's sort of speculation that the, the CIA was involved because they didn't like the Whitlam government. Yes, yeah, right. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I think it's a bit of a beat up in some ways, but yep. it, but it was a it was a very difficult time constitutionally. There's no doubt about that. Yep. Uh, and to be there and see it all happening was interesting. Actually, it was interesting to me in a, in a, in a personal way because I was in Sydney at the, on the day he was dismissed. And as the head of the Foreign Investment Division, I was speaking to a, a bunch of um, uh, senior Japanese businessmen who wanted to know what the policy was. And I was in the middle of my spiel to these gentlemen and I became aware somebody was sort of muttering something over my shoulder. And eventually, his voice came through to the PR system and said, they've sacked Whitlam. And immediately, the Japanese all, all left. And so I never finished my speech. <laughs> Fair enough. What do you think of the, the political debate in those days when you're as a, um, in, the, in the whole machine? versus what you see today? Well, I still watch Question Time and I get more and more depressed when I do. Uh, I, I, I just don't think there's nearly enough focus on big things, long-term issues. Um, I mean, if you compare the Chinese plans for, their, they've just announced their latest 10-year or 50-year plan, whatever it is, um, they, they, they 
clearly are long-range thinkers. Mm. Uh, I, I think one of the things that's been a problem in Australia recently has been the sort of revolving door of prime ministers, and there hasn't been... I think one of your mm. candidates on your podcast spoke wisely about this. And yes. Uh, it, it was an issue, but no, I, I just don't think there's enough focus. I, I think the government today has done a pretty good job on the COVID thing, mm -hmm. except for the supply of um, vaccines. vaccines. I yeah. think they've stuffed that up yep. in terms of getting it there quickly. I mean, we can do flu vaccines easily uh, and there's talk about it's not a race and so on i think it is a bloody race yeah. we've got to get them 80 percent of the population vaccinated if we don't we're going to have it's repeating and you're going to have the same kind of problem that, that india's got yeah. which is awful so i think it's a shame i do think morrison's move to set up a national cabinet was yeah. a very smart move you liked it did you i did it's far better than coag Yep. Uh, I mean, COAG served its purpose of, for a time, but it became a bit bureaucratized. It became, in my view, more concerned with process rather than outcomes. Mm -hmm. Whereas Morrison was going for the outcomes. You get the leaders together and they make a decision and bang, away you go. Uh, I hope that continues. Whether it will or not, I don't know. That's up to the governments, but uh, it was a good model. What about during when you were coming through the ranks in, in Australia, if I look at the young people today, a lot of them are just turning off politics. Turning off politics? Yeah. I think they are. I do. I mean, I, I, I can think of a lot of people that I've talked to who, who would never want to be a politician. And I think a lot of people I've talked to say, well, what, what the hell does the government do? I mean, uh, it's, it's interesting though, there's a contrast there, I think, because they, People criticise governments, and I think that's always what happens. Whatever, yeah. Whoever's in, in power, there's, there's got to be someone to criticise. But there's also now out there um, an entitlement mentality, and that worries me. Mm -hmm. I don't think people are selfish. I think the community has shown it can rally around and do things. But this entitlement mentality is, is a bit troubling. Mm -hmm. uh, they owe me, I've earned this, I'm entitled. Me, me, I'm entitled. I, I don't like that. No. So, I mean, you just got to get off your ass and do things yourself. Yeah, got to agree more. Yes. Now, speaking of which, when you got off your backside and started doing stuff and you went from the government side of uh, the equation back to corporate, what's the story about you move into Commonwealth Bank and you becoming chair? It's slightly lengthy, I suppose. Um, when I um, was chief executive of Monia, mm. uh, which was my first private sector job, I said to my board, we should have ministers and shadow ministers here to talk to us um, so that they know what we're doing yeah. and we can perhaps make an input that might help them. Yeah, right. And the first shadow minister we got was Paul Keating, whom I'd got to know when I was working in Canberra. Okay. Um, and we respected one another. Um, I still don't think Paul knew where I voted. I don't think he does to this day. Um, so we got Paul and he wowed the board. He, he really did. I mean, he talked about how he and his father had these concrete plants and they cut the guts out of the market and did this and that and so on. And they were sort of sitting there sort of spellbound a bit by this man who was talking a sort of language they understood. So when he went down to his car, I went down with him to farewell him. When I came back, I said, what did you think? And one board member said, I was horrified. He happened to be the representative of Redland PLC, which was a major shareholder in uh, in Monia. Yep. And I said, why, Sir Peter, why why were you horrified? He said, because he was so good. Is that right? So subsequently, so therefore I knew Paul. And subsequently, Bernie Fraser, who was then, I think probably governor of the Reserve Bank. Yeah. Paul sent him to me to ask for we asked him to come and see me uh, to get some names of businessmen who could perhaps go on the Commonwealth Bank board. 
So I gave Bernie a bunch of names. And at the end of it, I said, I could be interested in myself, Bernie. And that was that. Nothing more was said. And I don't know, time and a half went by and I was with my son in somewhere up the coast uh, at a Christmas time. And he came out and said, there's a, somebody on the phone that says Paul Keating wants to talk to you. And I said, oh, I mean, uh, is there any indication of what, what, what he wants? And he said, no, no, no. So I went in and I picked up the phone and he said, good day, mate. How'd you like to be chairman of the fucking Commonwealth Bank? <laughs> you better delete that word. <laughs> but, and that's exactly what he said. And when I recovered, I said, well, no, <laughs> it sounds pretty nice, but I'd have to, you know, <laughs> I'd have to, I'd have to sort of gear up a bit, wouldn't I? <laughs> No, no, no. Anyway, he subsequently said to me, you know, you've got the balance. You've worked in the public sector, you worked in the private sector. You've got exactly the kind of skills I think the chairman of the bank should have. So we became good working friends. Um, and he was the man who saw the problem that was emerging in Victoria. And the Victorian State Bank had an merchant bank that was out of control yeah right uh, and he said to me in the, one of the chats where we, we the, the, we're going to have to bail them out okay. so why don't we privatize the commonwealth bank and buy the state bank of victoria uh, this was the grand plan and that's really how that move started now i give paul the credit for that he he could see the way to go and, and he he took on an amazingly difficult task for him and his and his party yep. i mean the commonwealth bank was a kind of a treasure really and to, to privatize that my god you know so he had to persuade them and he did over a time uh, in the meantime i was getting calls from people like john kane a former premier about you know you, you 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 can't do this to the bank you can't uh, all that stuff and but when Joan Kerner came in yep. she knew they had to do something and she was in agreement with the idea of selling the state bank of Victoria right. and so it was I suppose hawked about a bit Westpac was very keen uh, and in fact at one time as the numbers went they were offering more than we were uh, and Paul tweaked our offer, the government's offer, not our offer, and sweetened it with a bit of tax sweetening as well yeah. and uh, we came out on top. But it was interesting because at the, the weekend that happened, David Murray, John, Ralph and I, and we were the sort of team on this privatisation, were in Melbourne. We had had long discussions with bank officials and departmental people. Yep. And I can remember on a, on a Sunday, I think it was, yes it was, we said to their team, look, our office on the table till lunchtime today, otherwise it's off the table. It was accepted. And I have to say, working with Joan Kerner, she was amazingly good. She she would phone me and say, I know I'm going to get a question about the privatization, about the sale of our state bank. And the question will probably be along these lines. This is how I plan to answer it. You, would you be comfortable with that sort of an answer? And I thought, now what a wonderful thing to do. So I, I was, I have great admiration for her. She could see she had to try and keep everybody in the picture and didn't want to do it in a way that disrupted relationships, which was very smart, I thought. But this was a, just an exciting time of the whole of banking in Australia, wasn't it? It was. It was. And to be involved with it was terrific. Again, risk-taking too, wasn't it? Risk-taking? Yeah. It was. Because like you said, why would Mr. Keating decide to sell the treasure? Yes. And how did the Commonwealth Bank emerge from all this? I mean, you, mm. you have to look at what banking was like then. Maximum interest rates were set by the government. Okay. There was no competition really between the banks. 
And I think as David Murray put it, we got off the blocks pretty fast and we rather took our competitors by surprise. See, we had a bank that was fully unionized right to the top. The financial services sector union had an enormous say on who got promoted. It had been illegal to appoint people from outside the bank over the age of 24 years. So a combination of that sort of thing, that very strong union influence, the lack of competition, people were pretty comfortable in the Commonwealth Bank. Yeah, absolutely. You, know, you could even justify, really, really justify on good grounds, a golf banking day. Yeah. So there was a big issue. As David Murray says, it was perhaps harder to privatise the bank's culture yeah, right. than it was the bank. And so what we did is we brought in a lot of people at the top level as role models. Uh, and, and that strategy worked extremely well. It, it was, was a, a slowish process and people I know at, at times were, were concerned in the bank, well, what if we get privatised? Will we lose our jobs, etc.? Yeah, and, and I kept saying to them, to the groups, well, look, it doesn't matter who owns you, as long as you perform, you're right. What are you, what are you concerned about? And that was a philosophy that finally dawned on some others, others it didn't, but uh, it was just something that you had to do. And uh, again, I think from Hudson, you have to talk to the people. They've got to know what's happening. And he talked not only to the people outside, the taxpayers, and they could see their tax dollar being spent. Yep. He talked to people in the organisation. He'd go and talk to the drillers. He had a, a great relationship with Charlie Oliver, who was the secretary of the Australian Workers' Union, the only union in the, the working area at the time. Yeah. He got the arbitration commissioner to commission to appoint a special commissioner for the Snowy Mountains area. And there was never an industrial dispute in all the time I was there. Wow. There was the seeds of one once when somebody complained about a blowfly in the, in the mess at GI camp, I think it was. And <laughs> so William said, well, come on, Mr. Bersley, we'll jump on a plane, in a plane and go out and sort it out. <laughs> and he went out there. I happened to go with him. We had a network of airstrips around the, the scheme so you could pop around. And he talked to these people. It was an, an issue. They were looking for an issue. And he sorted that issue out very easily, but so it went away and it never built up. And he could see the importance of doing things like that, nipping him in the bud, getting out and talking. A lesson that I think we all should pay very great attention to in these days. Remember at the beginning of the podcast, we talked about that, that doll of yours and the smoke? Yes. Is this the time when you're cool, calm and collected, when Mr Keating's backing you? You're taking that bank private. Is this when I don't get carried away with emotion? Yes, it was because there were some emotional bits to it, particularly in Canberra. Some of the people in Treasury were a bit aghast at, at this. Uh, in fact, one of them, um, who was ex officio a member of the first bank board after privatisation, said the Commonwealth Bank has always been a, a government business undertaking and always will be. He could not get his mind around the fact that once we became a listed entity with an independent board, yep. no one in Canberra could tell us what to do. Yeah, right. At the time of the float, this was an issue and we, because they wanted to put in the, in the prospectus that they would control the the salary, that the, the remuneration tribunal would control the salary of the chief executive of the Commonwealth Bank. And I, I wrote to them and said, um, if you want to do that, we're going to have to put that in the prospectus. And we don't think that'll do the float much good. If they can see there's going to be controls imposed on the bank any time from Canberra. And the minister at the time was a, was a Labor government. I can't remember who the Minister for Industrial Relations was, but he was very strong on this. Anyway, they they gave away to our logic, I'd like to think. Uh, and he happened, I think, to be a wine leave at the time. I don't know whether he ever forgave us for it, but it doesn't matter much. The, the, the system dealt with it and dealt with it effectively. And the, that was not mentioned in the 
prospectus, so the issue that we feared did not arise. Okay. You're impressed where banking is at today? I was disappointed in what banking went through. Uh, I think the inquiry into the banking showed that it had got out of control a bit, that um, KPIs had become the magic thing, and there was, as I say, I was disappointed that Banky had done that. I remember being interviewed by a writer who I know quite well, and she's published a book called Bad Banking. We took from time to time a team of analysts and journalists to, to see what we were doing in, for example, in uh, Indonesia. And we showed them the, the mines we were mining in Kalimantan and other places for coal in that sense and, and uh, other minerals and other areas. Because we found that if we did that sort of thing, you would always get a much better analyst story about what the company was doing yep. and a much better view of uh, from the journalists who they'd, they'd actually been there and seen it. Yep. And there's nothing like seeing a great front end loader loading up great scoops of coal and so on. And so that sort of thing, I think, is what you need to do. And you think that the banks have lost their way doing that, did you? Well, I do. I, I think they, they, they did. They didn't, didn't, um, they didn't talk enough to people really about their image. I think they became, I think the corporate sector became obsessed with uh, those sort of things generally, um, ESG and so on. Uh, and I think I remember David Murray recently made an outburst about that we're there to, yeah, yeah. with the banks the businesses are there to make a profit for the shareholders i'm digressing a bit but banks i think went too hard at it and f forced people to meet kpis which were measured in terms of how many people you signed up for your insurance or you how many loans had you pushed out and did you really think about the capacity of the, the person getting the loan to, to pay and and that came out in the Royal Commission. As yeah. I said, I was disappointed. Fair enough. Now, you're also, uh, you were chair of Leighton's as well. I was. And there was a young I was man. I headhunted for that too. <laughs> Good. And there was a young man who was CEO, um, Wal King. The question I really want to ask about is you've got a very strong person in David Murray, CEO of Commonwealth Bank, and you've got Wal King who's about to take on the world in regards to Leighton's. As a chair, how do you work with strong personalities and get the best out of them? Well, I think I can best, well, I think David summed up best the, the relationship that he and I had. Um, he said, Tim never told me to do anything, but we achieved an awful lot working together. And that's how I was able to work with him. With Wal, um, Wal was a different sort of, I mean, David didn't take fools kindly. I mean, he was... A tough character. Wall was tough, but he was also a fun man. Uh, not that David didn't have a sense of humour, but Wall was deliberately funny, and he'd make comments about the chairman, sort of, you know, and in front of other people. And you know, we were in a airstrip in Kalimantan somewhere, and there was a great carved individual there and it had a great sort of a phallic symbol winding around. He said, look at the prick, as long as the prick of the chairman. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I would never take offense at that. That was Wall. And Wall <laughs> can be managed uh, with the help of Dieter Adamsis. We, oh, yeah. we formed a troika we were the, the power group, it's known as, and I think when we were, Wall was someone who could, he, he was like Hudson in a way, a great people person. He, he could, um, apart from some of his little flippancy things, <laughs> when we won the license for the casino, which we wanted so we could build what was going to be the biggest building in Australia at the time, uh, he stood up and to a little group of us at the bottom of the office in which we were working at the time and said we got the license and they there was sort of a crowd just sort of automatic we love you all we love you you know i mean this, this is the sort of thing he could he could inspire in the teams and uh, he, he was a great guy to work with tough mm. but needed to steer here and there but but if you knew how he ticked i mean i i never ever had a vote in any board meeting that I chaired ever, 
we were always able to come out with some consensus that was definitely not the lowest common denominator. Yeah, okay. The biggest problem I had in that sense was when I chaired this, the CRC, the Cooperative Research Centre on Greenhouse Gas Technology, yep. the rules for that were that anybody who contributed to it in either cash or kind, yes. the Commonwealth put money in, yep. the private sector put money in, uh, the universities largely did it with by kind, yep. but as more and more uh, universities came on board, I found myself chairing a meeting of, of 30 odd members, that, uh, which was impossible. Yeah, okay. When you get a, a board like that, people naturally tend to push their own barrow, no matter how much you talk about the goodness of the whole. And it took me a long time to get that board down from 30 to I think nine in the end I managed without cutting out too many people who didn't feel that their, their views could be put. Okay. But it's very important, I think, to have a board who that thinks for the whole. Now, as Chancellor of a University, you chair, yep. in the case of Macquarie, it's, uh, it's called the Council. Yep. In the case of Sydney, it's called the Senate, uh, which is like the board. Yep. Um, at the time I was there, the council was appointed by the upper house of parliament appointed a member, the lower house of parliament appointed a member, the staff uh, appointed a member, the students council appointed a member, all had a say. So you had this hodgepodge of things and no matter how many times you talked about the role of a board and the, therefore a council, it had to be for the good of the whole. I, I went horse doing it, I suppose, but yeah. but it, it was a hard struggle. Now, things have changed now. The, the board, the council at Macquarie is appointed much more like an ordinary board. Yep. But one of the interesting appointees when I was chancellor was Eddie Obeid oh, yeah. from the upper house. Yeah. Now, he never turned up and never turned up and never turned up. So I wrote to the president of the, of the uh, upper house and said, well, um, obviously... Mr. Obeid is too busy to come to a council meeting, so you, you might think it appropriate to appoint somebody else. And, and, and almost within 48 hours, Eddie was on the, on the phone saying, I've been appointed and I'm going to come. I'm, I'm, I'm a member of that council. And yes, well, he never turned up after that either. So if the structure allows boards and councils and senates to be appointed without due regard to, to what are you going to get and how is it going to run the place, then you get all sorts of weird results. Yeah, okay. And that was one. But during your career, you've been somewhat exposed to an enormous amount of change. Yes, I have. So how do you deal with change? Well, I've never been afraid of change. I, I embrace change. I think you you have to, um, and I think now particularly you have to change as we try and digitise, uh, and digitise we must. Uh, so that's never been a worry. In fact, I've I've liked change, and I've tried to adapt, and uh, I think I've generally managed to find a way to do that. Are you impressed which way we're going with regards to? where technology is taking us and where regulation is sort of playing catch up? Well, you're right, it's playing catch up. I think one of the good things in the budget was the, I think it was 1.2 billion they set aside for digitization. Yes. But I think a key thing is going to be how is it spent and how is it measured? I was one time president of one of the so-called learned academies, which has got engineers and scientists in it. And okay. And it's really in the DNA of people like that to measure. So I think there's going to have to be some sensible metrics established to see how are we going? Are we getting value for the money that's being spent to digitize? Mm -hmm. And you could you think, like, well, how, what are you going to measure? Uh, you're going to measure um, greater productivity. Uh, we've got some metrics for that. Mm. Are you going to measure, uh, is the workplace safer? Uh, but, it, but that needs to be thought through. And I, and I think the government ought to seriously think about taking advice from some of the learned academies more often than it does. Okay. It does from time to time. And 
the four academies come together to work as it's called ACOLA, the Australian Council of Learned Academies, either to undertake a, a project that they have thought they ought to do or to respond to a request from government. Uh, and I think that sort of approach should happen more often. And I think in particular, mm -hmm. in digitisation, the government ought to reach out to the Academy, Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering, uh, where there's a whole raft of expert people. I'm not saying there aren't any in the bureaucracy. I'm not saying that at all. Yeah. But you need more. I mean, it's not, not a, a competition. You need to collaborate and you need to measure. China. China. <laughs> How do you see our role? And how do you see the relationship? Uh, I think China's got a deliberate... Well, China stated it wants to restore its old glory. She is very open about that. Mm. Uh, I've read two books, one called The Silent Invasion and one called uh, The Trap of the Belt and Road Program. Yep. And if you read those books written by respectable researchers... Uh, there's, there's no doubt that they'll do anything that it takes to get them to where they want to be. I mean, the, if, if you if you look at what's happening in our universities, they've mainly got um, uh, Confucius societies and so on, funded by China. That's that's fine, mm -hmm. but it's a way of getting your minds across and your knowledge of what research is happening. There are many very good researchers who are Chinese in our universities. Yep. And, um, you know, I think she regards them as the diaspora out there, the, the group that he can, they're still Chinese uh, wherever they are, just like Putin says, Russians are still Russians wherever they are. Yep. It's that sort of thing in their psyche. Yep. So I think we've got to try and manage it better than we have. I think we were not smart the way we virtually said, you've spread COVID around the world. Well, that's more or less how he's taken it. Yeah, okay. And there's all this rumours about, did it get loose from the Chinese laboratory? Well, who knows? But that's not a smart way to deal with a, a sensitive person. I mean, we, we need to know more about their culture than I do, yeah. but I do understand their culture is different because for a time I was very much involved with some of the work that Leighton was doing up in Hong Kong. Yeah, um, and they are different. That's one thing that we don't manage well enough. Now, somehow we've got to find a way to to get to the table with them to talk, but that's going to take a bit of skill, uh, and I'm not sure who can help us with that. And what about uh, the US? Where do you see their role now? Yeah, in respect to China and also the whole play. As you said, you got Syria, you got well, sorry, you got Iran now playing a very forceful hand in Middle East. You've got the Russians uh, under Mr. Putin starting to push back more and more. And then, as you said, Mr. Xi. So what's, where's the US going to play? And what are we supposed to do? Well, I think all we can sensibly, we're, we're a, a middle range power. Uh, we've got a lot of smart people here, um, but I think we've got to recognize we are middle range. We've got to keep our lines open with five eyes and our association with the US is important. And somehow we've got to also, I think, reactivate some of the trade issues with China. So it's a, it's a conundrum that I, I think China's got to understand that we, we're not going to be pushed around, but we need to respect what they want to do, or they need to respect that we've got some views on how they do it. And they've also got to, I think, look up the cultural pipeline at us better than they do. And we've certainly got to look up that pipeline to understand their culture better than I think we do at the moment. Although I suspect we probably do understand them better than they understand us. So what do we do as a nation? Do we hunker down and, and go for growth? We don't hunker down. I think we've got to go for growth. I mean, we, we need to get back to the point where we can have a good, vigorous immigration policy. Okay. Uh, choosing the sort of people to come, not just economic refugees, okay. because we've got a, a large country with lots of undeveloped parts up north, not undeveloped, but not as developed as I believe it's possible for them to be. Mm -hmm. I've just done a wonderful journey around the Northern Territory and Northwestern Queensland, yep. 
we flew to Darwin and went by road from there to Cairns, went round the Gulf, saw all sorts of interesting things. Just one example, there's a, a zinc mine up in the Northern Territory, which was once the third largest zinc mine in the world. Is that right? Uh, it was the century mining. Uh, there's now a new century mining, which is working on the tailing dams of that mine. And it is now the third biggest zinc mine in the world. So there's there's lots of minerals up there. There's, there's lots of water. There's uh, schemes that have been um, talked about in the past, uh, the, the Bradfield scheme and so on. I think what's what needs to be done is there needs to be a, a total look at the North involving the Commonwealth and the States. The Snowy Scheme was born out of a, a Commonwealth States team of officials who did this broad look. There'd been plans to tip some water through the Great Divide to the irrigation areas. Um, you know, th thoughts about that in the 80s yep. uh, when, when there was a drought and there'd been some thoughts about tapping the snowy for hydro when there was electricity shortages. Yep. And finally, uh, under a government, a group of officials from the, the states and the Commonwealth got together and developed this scheme of sending water through for the snow scheme through to the Murray and Murrumbidgee irrigation areas and at the same time dropping it through a lot of power stations yep. to produce electricity. Electricity, mm -hmm. and, and that's what needs to be done up north. We need to look at it in the broad, and um, because you've you've got the situation where constitutionally water issues are state issues, and yep. so on, and so therefore you've got different states' views. To me, that's that would be the sensible way to go. We actually suggested to our minister at the time of the, the snowy was coming to a conclusion yep. that we ought to be used to be redeployed up to the north. And we actually produced a paper and we had a headquarters, I think I went Con Curry or somewhere or other, I forget now. But that paper went to the minister who was David Fairburn at the time, which as ministers do, went to, it went straight to his department. That's what ministers do, you get them. And the departmental head at the time was Sir Lennox Hewitt. And he didn't like Hudson. Uh, he was jealous. He's, Lennox, is de Lennox is dead now. He, he died recently at the age of 102. <laughs> but he, he, Hudson was always getting plaudits for doing great things, justifiably. And Lenny in Canberra was sort of a bit jealous of that. So what he did was pay lip service to it. He set up a northern division in his department, which Rex Patterson headed, uh, and he soon thereafter went into, into politics, yep. and that division just disappeared. Disappeared. What a shame. Yeah. So I, I think somebody sometime is going to have to think about the north in a more comprehensive way involving both the states and the Commonwealth. Things have changed a little bit in the boardroom now, and there's, there's a lot of discussion around diversity and a lot of discussion around ESG. Different to your day? Very different. Well, we, we did have on the first Commonwealth Bank Board, we had two women. We were sort of one of the early ones. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think uh, we have not taken advantage of half the population, really. Okay. Um, and I think it's there's no doubt that you get a, a better balanced view if you've got gender balance. Um, I don't think you should just have gender balance for the sake of getting the numbers right. Yeah. I think setting quotas is dumb. Some people do it. Uh, I think you you just have to open your mind up to look around and see when you're looking for a talent. And I guess people like you are in a, an ideal position to do that. Yeah, that's true. And I'm sure you do. We do. A couple of last questions, Tim. What's leadership to you? Well, I've always tried to set some goals for myself, achieving those goals. Um, I've always tried to get where you can uh, some kind of a yardstick of how are we doing. I remember in customs, um, and I had the appointment then, I had the lofty title of Comptroller General of Customs because the Act was pretty ancient. 
um, and I wanted to get a metric for how we were doing. So I went to CSIRO and I said, look, how can we set up a metric that, I mean, for example, I could tell you how much drug we're, we're catching coming in. I don't know how much we're missing, yep. but there's other things Customs does. In fact, we had one of the best order entry systems in the world at the time. Uh, we were getting an awful lot of information about the importation of goods. And the Americans actually sent people out from the American Customs to look at our system because okay. uh, they thought it was pretty good. The upshot of that in one way was I was invited to go and visit them in in uh, New York. And they picked me up at the airport in a customs helicopter and flew me in amongst the skyscrapers. <laughs> it was cool, I can tell you. <laughs> Fair enough. But going back to you, your philosophy about how you measure yourself. Yeah, well, I would like to think that um, the companies I've worked for um, better than when I became involved, um, whether they were. I mean, Bonnie got taken over, so was that better or was that a great loss? But we received an offer that we just could not turn down, so you, you do that and it's a responsibility to your shareholders. I mean, I was concerned very much about safety always because Hudson was hot and strong on safety. He had a joint safety council of all the heads of the contractors, no, no deputies, the head man had to come. And they swapped information and looked at what was happening and tightened the things up. We had a remedial gymnast in the snowy for, for our own workers to get injured workers back to work. So strong, strongly on that. Now at, at Monia, uh, the safety record when I looked at it, the accident frequency rate was, I thought, too high. And so I said, uh, well, I've got to do something about that. So I issued an edict. They thought I was mad. I said, I want four bits of information on any lost term accident that occurs in any of our operations anywhere in the world. And we were operating then in Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Japan, and the US. And I got those four bits of information and the, the accident frequency rate in a year halved. Just for asking for information. Safety was a, a top issue for the board, for me and the board. And I think that's how it's got to be. So to me, that's, that's a measure of success. Second last question, which is, when I was asking a couple of my uh, younger people on the team today, and talking about this, getting an opportunity to meet someone who's uh, seen so much during their life, how do you become successful? How do you build those networks? As you say, you came from New Zealand. You didn't grow up in, in the top private schools here in Australia. You didn't have the mum and dads who are members of parties, etc. What's the philosophy behind it all? I think you have to show that you can uh, accept responsibility. You have to make sure you work well with whoever comes across your path. I mean, uh, you may not respect a minister, uh, but and some I've worked for, I didn't did not much, but I never let that influence my role as an honest policy advisor to the ministers. Mm -hmm. And I treated Keating with great respect. I admired his intellect, um, and I think that I have to say that the fact that I had that relationship, which I was not seeking to build up for any purpose, was why he reached out and said, God, how about that guy, Besley? He seemed to be a reasonable sort of a bloke or something. And um, that's how he got Bernie to get that rather interesting approach to me. Uh, but, I, but I've never tried to think, now, who can I, who can I cozy up to now? Okay. Just that I, I respect people I understand that they may have very different views to me and I understand that they're entitled to have those views. It doesn't mean I don't think they're a person I could work with. So that's always been my philosophy that you have to respect that everyone's got some good in them is always where I start from. Uh, and I think if you can, if you can get a team together that collaborates and works 
with a common purpose to what you're trying to do. And I think I've demonstrated I can manage that. And people say, well, uh, we could give this guy a bit of a go, maybe. And Tim, if you were to look back at that young man, I guess at the age of 23, jumping on that plane, flying six and a half hours and landing in or on Rose Bay many years ago. <laughs> Hopefully not in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not in it, but on it. What advice would you give him now? Be true to yourself. Don't be afraid of taking a calculated risk. Always be prepared to have a go. Uh, my father uh, drilled the work ethic into his boys, uh, and I've got a, I'd like to think, a, a very good work ethic. I've never been a nine to five person all my life. I just think they're the kind of things I would like to give me if I was giving me advice in retrospect as I entered on that adventure, which it was, um, it's an exciting adventure. Just always be prepared to have a go. Uh, and don't shrink from taking responsibility and don't be afraid of taking calculated risks. That's the thing, three things I would stress. Tim, really enjoyed today. Thank you very much for making the time. Well, thank you, Greg. I've wandered all over the place a bit, but who knows what will emerge. <laughs> no, it's been, it's been terrific. You've been listening to No Limitations. <laughs>